So I'd like to welcome everybody to the third part of my three-part series on the sandwich generation and how we um, are all juggling the, um, the sandwich generation. And um, if everyone would please mute themselves because I forgot to do that just now and I don't wanna figure out how. So if you would just mute yourself so we don't hear any background noise, I'd appreciate that. So again, welcome. Um, I'm Vicki Stein. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I have a doctorate in holistic nutrition. And I have my, um, in this PowerPoint presentation, I have the same slide at the front and the back. So you have all of my contact information. Please feel free to contact me either by text or email. You can go on my website. Uh, there's a place there for emailing. There's also a place for scheduling an appointment with me. So um, I offer individual and couples work as well as mentoring for professionals um, and consults and education around nutrition. So we're gonna talk today about, uh, about our elderly um, friends and neighbors and, um, and how we can hopefully help them as we, um, as we still all continue to navigate the COVID-19. And of course, we, some of our states are coming off of isolation and shelter in place, so things are shifting yet again. Although I know a lot of us, even though our, our politicians are telling us it's safe, many of us are still feeling like we need to honor shelter in place and honor um, the safe distancing. So I do anticipate that a lot of our elderly people are going to continue to feel isolated and be isolated as we try to protect them until we have some cure, um, whether it's a vaccine or some way of mitigating uh, the virus once somebody gets it. So it's important to remember that we are social. And um, I love this picture because it really does show, um, you know, to me that's a Sunday afternoon picnic and you can see the different generations together and everybody sharing food and, and sitting on each other's laps and visiting. And this is really who we are. We are social and we count on our families and our communities. And it can be any kind of community that we, um, that we um, are attracted to or we um, identify with. So it might be just your neighborhood it might be your actual biological family. It might be an adopted family. Um, it could be a religious community. Um, I'm a rower and we have a rowing community. Um, so anytime that there is any particular interest, we tend to find community around those interests and those people. And we need those things to survive and to thrive. And I think that the more we uh, get into this isolation, separation, the more apparent I think it's becoming. One of the things that I hear from a lot of my friends, not just my older friends, but even my, my son, my 29-year-old son said this to us last week when he was here, people are missing hugs. We are a very, we are a physical being and we like to be touched. So it's not just about being together, but it's also about sharing um, a bit of ourselves. And a lot of times we do that as we greet each other with hugs. Uh, and people are missing out on that on that contact. We are also, um, how we interact defines who we are. If you think about um, when you talk to a child or, or a teenager, we ask them questions like, where do you go to school? What grade are you in? Um, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And that helps us to figure out who they are and what's going on in their lives and maybe a little bit about their values. But we do the same thing with adults. We ask people, one of the first questions is usually, what do you do? Where do you live? Do you have family? Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? So we are trying to figure out where people sit in our, in our society and what their roles are and what their place is. And we need each other to interact and to figure out where we belong with each other and with ourselves. So I wanted to just give a, a definition of social isolation because isolation can be different than distancing. With social isolation, that really does mean that there is a lack of contact. So there is an absence of that person being involved with other people in society. And we, we have all been somewhat isolated in our 
um, social distancing and with our shelter in place. But some of us have gotten creative. We've learned how to do drive-by birthday parties and we've learned how to uh, use technology to connect with each other in a way that maybe um, our younger um, people, in our, the younger generations have already known how to do, but that we have had to learn how to do and we're relying heavily on it. But people who are older aren't always good at that kind of technology and um, aren't able to connect it with people the way that they, they had been able to before. Isolation is different than loneliness. Loneliness is an actual feeling. It is a feeling of emptiness and sadness and craving human contact. And you can feel lonely even in a crowd. And maybe you have experienced that before where you have been in a group of people and you didn't feel acknowledged, you didn't feel a part of the group. And so you might have felt lonely even while you were in, in a group of people. So isolation can create loneliness, but loneliness doesn't always mean that we are isolated. So I wanna talk a little bit about the effects on the body when it comes to isolation, because this is one of the biggest concerns that I have with our elderly uh, population. And an elderly, by definition, can be 55 years old and older. Now, I just turned 60, so I fall into this category of being in the elderly category, um, but I, I am a very active adult, I work, um, I have a lot of friends. And so for me, it's different than say somebody who is in a nursing home. And so I worry about those people a lot. I worry about the folks that um, are used to relying on family visits, maybe once a week, maybe every day, who can't have that now, or even people who get sick, who now have to go into the hospital and aren't allowed to have visitors. I have had several colleagues that that has recently happened to. So there is an additional level of stress because of this shelter in place that's being impact, that's impacting our older community. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about stress uh, in some future slides. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time right here, but um, effects of isolation include stress, anxiety, depression, um, having worse health, which uh, in, under normal circumstances, we find that there is an increase in visits to doctor's offices. Now, I think with COVID, we're finding that a lot of people are avoiding going to doctors because they're afraid of being in a medical facility. They're afraid of going to an ER or a hospital. And so some things may be actually festering and becoming worse than they would have under normal circumstances. And we also know that mortality rates increase. There was a study shown um, in the UK that showed that men who had fewer than six friends had a 90% increased risk of cardiovascular disease or of dying from suicide or accidents. And many of us have known older couples who have been married for many, many years, decades, that when one person passes away, frequently the second partner will die within a short period of time. And this is partly because of the isolation. People talk about them dying of a broken heart, and that is actually true. It actually increases cardiovascular disease and can, can cause issues for um, heart disease that can cause um, death. And it also can create um, an autoimmune, an increase in autoimmune disease. So what happens when we're under stress, when we experience stress? One of the things that happens is that the brain doesn't know the difference between whether we're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger or whether we're not being visited by our loved ones. And so our body responds in the same way, no matter what the stressor is. And so it is that fight or flight or freeze response. You can see um, in these pictures, I have um, a cat who is, um, who is ready to fight, um, a beautiful eagle who's flying and a deer who's frozen. And these, it, you know, this is stuff that happens in the animal kingdom, but it also, we are, we are wired exactly the same way. Our brain will introduce um, epinephrine and, um, and or adrenaline, and that triggers a whole response through the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are two little glands 
that sit on top of your kidneys. They're the size of walnuts and they will secrete something called cortisol. So when we go into that fight or flight response, we have that adrenaline and we're all familiar with what that rush of adrenaline feels like. But then we also have this level of cortisol and cortisol has an effect on our, on our physical system. And it does certain things to us like our pupils will dilate and our heart will start racing and our blood pressure will change and the blood will pump out to our arms and our legs so that we're in a position to either fight or to run. Our digestive system slows down. Our bodies often will get sweaty so that we're slippery. If, our, if somebody were to fight us and grab onto us, they would slip if they were to reach out and try and pull on our arms or our legs. So we have this whole physical reaction that's occurring. And when we're in true danger, this is a great response. But when we are under chronic stress and we stay in this chronic state of stress, it is a wear and tear on the body. So some of the things that affect that the that stress does to our bodies is it can impact sleep. So when we are under stress, and we've probably all experienced this to some extent, you have a lot on your mind, you toss and turn, you, you have a hard time um, sleeping at night. And so the more you have difficulty sleeping, the more disruptive that is to your body and to the rest that you are supposed to be getting during, um, during sleep. So um, when we have trouble with sleep, then we become more stressed. And when we become more stressed, we, we end up having more problems with our sleep. So it does become a negative cycle. Our hormones are affected. So our thyroid glands are impacted and thyroid manages things like weight and body temperature and lots of other different body functions. So our thyroid can get out of whack. It also affects our sex hormones. Now, our older adults may not think that they need to worry about that so much, but the sex hormones include things like um, testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. And even though someone might not be sexually active or they might not be in their child rearing years anymore, having our hormones in balance is still important in terms of how our bodies function. So if we are under a lot of stress and those hormones start to get out of whack, we will start to experience some physical uh, responses to that as well. Our immune health gets impacted. So short-term stressors can be good in, active, in, um, in, in our immune system. So for example, if you cut your finger, then you are going to create an immune function. It's a stress. You're going to have a whole cascade of cells that are going to race to that cut and try and heal the body. That's an acute response to the stress, and it's a good one. It's really what we want. But the long-term effect of being under stress creates something called inflammation. And inflammation is, is not a good thing in the long run. Again, it's, it's helpful in the short term for something that's acute. But when we're talking about long-term stress, it can actually cause cardiovascular disease as well as lots of other um, physical health issues. Immune dysfunction is actually the foundation for many, many of our, our diseases. Um, our digestion will also slow down. As I mentioned, um, that's part of the fight or flight response because our body doesn't feel like it's necessary to be digesting food at a time when it's trying to protect us and keep us safe. So digestion will actually slow down. And the problem with that is that it then impacts our gut health and it allows for the mucosal lining to be attacked by or um, allowed for allowing bacteria to adhere to those, um, those cells and create gut dysfunction and imbalance. It can cause cramping, it can cause inflammation in the digestive tract, and it can cause, like I said, just a basic general gut disbalance. Now, the gut and the brain are connected to each other by the vagus nerve, and it is a bi-directional uh, information pathway which means that information from the brain goes to the gut, but also information from the gut goes to the brain. And so when the gut is not working properly, if it's inflamed or if we have an imbalance of bad bacteria over the good bacteria, we will see things like anxiety and depression and sleep disorders. Uh, in one of my um, lectures that I do around the country, I talk about this for quite some time. This is a very important connection and so making sure that the gut is working properly 
so that people can manage their stress properly so that their body can stay calm and in the rest and digest phase as opposed to in the fight or flight response. And then stress can also impact pain. So if somebody is in chronic stress, they might also have a decreased it can reduce the, the pain threshold. And so um, medication may also not work as well and people may become more sensitive to their pain. That in turn can cause more stress. And so just like the sleep cycle, it becomes a negative cycle of pain creating stress and the stress creating more pain. So talking about stress and knowing that our elderly um, loved ones and community members are under stress. We need to understand this is very, this could be potentially serious and that we need to really support people. This is um, just some additional information about the emotional influences of inflammation. The, these were some research studies that were done with different age groups, not just the elderly. This one was looking at military cadets and when they were under acute mental stress, sleep deprivation and physical, physical exertion, they had an increased a susceptibility to infectious disease. So when we're looking at COVID and we're worrying about our elderly um, folks getting sick, we need to understand that having them under acute stress can increase their risk. It can also play a role in developing allergies. It can, as I mentioned before, also impact the, um, the bowel and the mucus and the mucus permeability in our guts. And it can also increase bacteria and yeast adherence to, um, to our guts, it leading to overgrowth and infection. And it can also lead to sleep disturbances and insomnia. So how do we support the adrenals? Because if the adrenals are, are secreting uh, cortisol, then what, one of the, thing, the obvious things that we need to do, aside from helping people manage their stress at the beginning, is to also support the adrenal glands. So, there, I'm going to talk at length um, later about how to help manage adrenals, but also helping um, our elderly get enough sleep, making sure that they laugh. I talked last time about Norman Cousins, who cured his cancer by staying in a hospital and watching tons and tons of funny videos and movies and literally laughing his way to health. There is a lot of information out there about, um, about laughter and the healing um, the healing properties of laughter. So maybe sending cards. We'll talk later about how we can um, we can help to um, our um, our friends and family to navigate some of these things. Getting physical exercise, I'll also mention, um, and good nutrition. Um, with good nutrition, a lot of times this is going to be challenging if somebody is staying in a nursing home or in some other facility where they don't have a lot of control. So um, it might be up to the family to, uh, to, to um, provide some additional nutrition, maybe by sending some food or um, dropping some food off if that's allowed, and managing food allergy sensitivities and addictions. So these are all different ways to support our adrenals. Um, adaptogens are also another way of supporting adrenal glands. So adaptogens are herbal supplements that have been very well researched, mostly by the Russians. They are, uh, they are herbs that help to support the adrenal glands. They help to support blood sugar. All of the adaptogens have similar properties in that they all support adrenal gland function, um, but they all also have additional properties. So depending on what is going on with the person that you care about, what adrenal function, what um, adaptogen supplements they might wanna take. So there, rhodiola, ginseng, and ashwagandha are just three of them. These are um, all very well researched. Others include holy basil, um, kava kava, um, and cordyceps. Now, you will find that a lot of times, if you are looking for an adrenal support product, there are lots of supplements out there that combine these, uh, these different adaptogens and will create an entire... Uh, supplement. So for example, there's a company called Zymogen. They have one called Adrenal Essence. And it's a combination of these three plus a couple of others. Um, but every single supplement company will have some adrenal function supplementation. And so if you have a loved one who is really experiencing a lot of stress, 
supporting them with adaptogens supplements is a really nice way to help. These are some of the other supplements that, um, that we might consider. And I wanna just say, at the, before I talk about these supplements, supplements are really just that. They are there to supplement people when they need additional nutrition. So if you know somebody who is not eating well or somebody who you just worry about um, needing some, they're not eating enough, um, a supplement might be appropriate. But also understand that if they are on medication, supplements are not inert. Supplements interact with the body, but they also can interact with medication. So before you suggest any supplements to somebody that you love, I would suggest talking to their doctor and checking it out. Um, pharmacists will also often be able to tell you if supplements um, are gonna interact with medication. I also have access to a database that if anyone had some questions, if you wanted to just talk to me, I'm happy to look up the supplement along with any medication that your loved one is on and see if there's any research that um, implements, it, it, that suggests that um, maybe they shouldn't be doing those supplements with their medication. The, so let's just talk about some of these. Um, this is a very basic um, listing of supplements. The first one is the, is the B complex. Um, B complex, the B vitamins are all water soluble. So you really can't overdose with them. Uh, it, you're just gonna get rid of whatever you don't use. But the, and, and they come, they work together, which is why I recommend a B complex. Now, in supporting the adrenal glands, B5 is the vitamin B that is most important. Vitamin C and B5 are the two vitamins that are used the most in our adrenal glands. And so if you're really wanting to boost the adrenal function, then just taking a B5 vitamin along with vitamin C is a great way to do that. But again, the B vitamins um, do work together. There are lots of them. There's B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, B12, B8. So it's best to really take that B complex together. And one of the things that's important to know about the B vitamins, like for example, B6. B6 is part of the pathway with serotonin that helps us to feel happy. So if you have a loved one who is feeling depressed, then perhaps they need some B6 um, because in order to convert protein into uh, serotonin so that they can make the, that neurotransmitter serotonin so they can feel happy, they have to have B6. Um, same thing with B12. Some people might be feeling some fatigue and they might be um, needing a B12 boost. Um, elderly people frequently need B12 boost because there is something in our guts that have, help us to absorb B12. It's called the intrinsic factor. And as we age, we have less hydrochloric acid in our stomach and we have less of the intrinsic factors. So we have a difficult time absorbing B12. So B12 can be involved in nerve damage and other, other issues, health issues, particularly in the elderly. So making sure that um, our loved ones are getting a B complex and also perhaps getting tested for B12 to see if they might need a boost in B12. Um, GABA and L-theanine, these are two of my all-time favorite supplements when it comes to anxiety. Um, GABA is a, a neurotransmitter that our bodies make. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means that when we are in the fight or flight response, GABA is one of the chemicals our body releases in order to help us to feel calm again. So when we can, we make GABA, it's part of our body's makeup. However, we can also supplement with it. And if you take GABA, it takes anywhere for, for me, it takes about 20 minutes to kick in. Um, the research shows it might take up to an hour, but you can take it as a capsule or a tablet. And within the 20 minutes to an hour, it will help you to feel calmer and less stressed. Um, and then L-theanine is an amino acid. It is um, the only amino acid that comes from a plant. It comes from green tea and green tea leaves. And it can be taken alone. It's useful for helping somebody to fall asleep at night. But when you combine the GABA and the L-theanine together, it has a really nice calming 
um, a calming effect on the body. So you can actually buy GABA and L-theanine together in products. You can find them in health food stores. Uh, Zymogen, a company I mentioned recently, earlier today, just now, um, they have a product called Relax Max, which is one of my favorites. It has GABA and L-theanine along with magnesium and anistatol and taurine in it. And it's a powder that can be used either for um, going to sleep at night or for helping someone during the day to calm themselves down. It has no, no effects, like no hangover effects. You don't feel foggy brain when you wake up. It won't make you pass out. It literally just makes you feel chill. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, you can contact me afterwards. Magnesium is considered the anti-stress mineral. We find it in dark green leafy vegetables and nuts and seeds. So if you have somebody who um, is older to make sure that they're eating a lot of greens, um, everything from parsley, cilantro, um, romaine lettuce, Swiss chard, spinach, making sure they're really getting a hefty dose of those, those uh, dark green leafy vegetables. Unfortunately, our, our soil has been depleted of magnesium, and so the plants who are, that are absorbing the magnesium and then we're eating the plants are not as enriched as they used to be. And so it is often necessary for us to go ahead and supplement with some magnesium. And you can buy magnesium um, in the store. One of the, there are lots of different kinds of magnesium. The most common brand and easiest one to find is one that's called Calm. It comes in a canister and it's a powder and you just scoop it and you can take it. Um, again, with um, our older folks, magnesium is off, often one of the minerals that they are deficient in. And understand that when we're under stress, when we're under stress or when we are eating a poor diet, when we're eating a lot of processed foods and a lot of um, processed carbohydrates like the white flour products like donuts and cakes and cookies and pasta, those kinds of things, all of those foods and the stress will actually decrease the B complex and the magnesium in our body. So it can cause a deficiency. So again, it's about making sure our loved ones are getting a complete balance of sleep and good nutrition, um, no matter where they are. And again, because stress can impact the gut and can cause dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the gut between good bacteria and bad bacteria, it is important that people take a probiotic. And there are lots of good ones on the market. Um, it, does, it doesn't change, you, you can't just take a probiotic and then expect that your gut is gonna be healthy. A probiotic is something that needs to be taken um, pretty much on a daily basis. Some probiotics that I recommend, they suggest that you only take them a couple times a week once you've repopulated the gut. Um, and if you've got a loved one who has been on an antibiotic lately or um, is or then or is on one now, then um, making sure that they balance the antibiotic with a probiotic is also going to be important for their gut health. And then vitamin D, I cannot stress enough. Vitamin D is a, it's actually a hormone, but um, it's been given the name, uh, it's you know, considered vitamin, a vitamin as well. We make it by synthesizing the sun in our, um, by getting exposed to the, um, exposing our skin to the sun. And um, a lot of our elderly people are not getting outside. And of course, when we go outside, we're taught to wear long sleeves, to wear sunscreen, to protect ourselves from the sun. So even when we're out, we're not probably getting enough. And I can say, even living in Atlanta, living in the South, I have only met one person in all of my clients who has had their vitamin D levels checked that had an adequate level of vitamin D. And so most of us should be supplementing. So the question is, how much should you supplement? A, an omega dose is considered at about 10,000 IUs or international units. Usually a doctor will prescribe that amount. It would be, you can't really find it on a shelf. You can find um, vitamin D at 5,000 IUs, 2,000 IUs, and 1,000 IUs on a health, you know, in a, in a health, health food store. Um, so I would say what I usually recommend people do is get their blood work tested, see what level they're at, and then they'll decide with their doctor whether they should be at 10,000 IUs or whether they can take 5,000 IUs for a period of time and then switch to a one or 2,000 IU supplement. One to 2,000 is considered maintenance, but you can't do the maintenance until you actually get to the level that you want. And if you look at somebody's lab work, 
it's important to understand what a functional lab will say. A functional lab will tell you that vitamin D levels, optimal levels, should be at 50 to 80 um, nanograms. I forget, I forget exactly what the measurement is on the lab report. But in a conventional lab, the lab report will often say 40 to 80 or 40 to 60. That 40 is too low according to functional medicine criteria. So if you have a physician who looks at that and says, oh, you, you have, your lab work says that you're at 37 and they consider 40 low normal, they're gonna tell you that you're okay or your loved one is okay. But if you should be at 50 as the low end of normal optimal, 37 is quite a ways away. So I always ask people to show me what their lab work is because I wanna be sure that their vitamin D levels are between 50 and 80. If they're below that, they need to be supplementing at at least 5,000. But again, I want people to check with their doctors. Vitamin D is fat soluble. It is not water soluble like the B complex. Vitamin D does get stored in our fat cells and you can have too much. Although I will say I have worked with a functional doctor in Atlanta uh, Dr. Ellie Campbell, who has done extensive research on vitamin D, and with her elderly patients, she does mega um, injection dosing, and she will be happy and comfortable if her patients are at 120, which is really high, but she says that in her mind, that's safe. Um, again, that's something that would need to be monitored by a doctor. So this is a recipe that I got out of a book um, by Dr. James Wilson. If you're interested in reading about adrenal support and adrenal fatigue, this is a, an adrenal support soup. And um, I have made this before, it's delicious. So if you live near somebody who is elderly and you're trying to support their adrenal glands and you wanna drop off something that they can eat and store in their refrigerator if they are independent, this would be a great uh, recipe that you could share with them. So how can elderly people support themselves? Because again, when we're talking about elderly people, we're talking about an age range of 60 and up. So it could be somebody like me who's still working and um, active in their community, or it could be somebody like my parents who are in their 80s who just retired in January, um, but are still living independently and exercise, or it could be somebody who is living in a nursing home or living in a 55 and up retirement community. So it's going to depend, of course, on what people, what their abilities are, how they're going to be able to support themselves. One of the things is to help them to find a, uh, and create a sense of purpose. Right now in my life, I have four friends from who are who I'm close to who are all widows or widowers. And um, and when I text them, because I do worry about them being as isolated as they are, the ones that have gardening as one of their activities seem to be the ones who are doing the best. They are just as happy as they can be because it is, now it's May 1st, but it's been April in Atlanta, the weather has been spectacular, and people have been out working in their yards. So for them, there is a huge sense of purpose. So gardening is one wonderful thing. Um, but helping them to connect with some other kind of activity that they might enjoy doing. I just listed a couple of things, um, knitting, craft work, like woodworking, um, or doing puzzles. Um, I've had some people tell me that they've really been enjoying doing jigsaw puzzles. They've never done them before. They've got them set up on the table, um, working with maybe um, doing some remote stuff. I've got um, people I know who are doing even remote playing poker together. So having some kind of purpose, some, something to look forward to and something that they can create can help them um, to manage their stress. Doing age appropriate workouts. So um, I've got a picture here of people doing Tai Chi. There is great research on Tai Chi and I, I have been um, a Tai Chi practitioner for probably 15 years now. And you can do Tai Chi as an older person there is great research. In fact, Emory did a ton of research in the 80s on Tai Chi and balance with elderly people. And they found that the more Tai Chi our older population did, the better their balance was. So you can learn how to do Tai Chi. There are Tai Chi videos online. Um, I'm happy to teach people Tai Chi. We could do it on, um, on Zoom. You can do Tai Chi. My synagogue actually offers Tai Chi um, to our older population and they do it sitting down. 
So Tai Chi is a very slow moving martial art. You've probably all seen in a movie, watching somebody doing the, the hand movements. Um, you can do that sitting or you can do that standing. Uh, it just depends on your ability. And of course, walking is a wonderful way of getting exercise, making sure that they have good walking shoes, making sure they have a flat surface to walk on where they won't have, you know, they, they have less chance of falling um, is certainly important. But whatever uh, age appropriate workouts they can do, even light weights, two pounds, one pound white weights can also help. Uh, managing medication, making sure that they are getting their meds, that they are meeting with their doctors, that they have their prescriptions filled out um, in advance so that they don't find themselves without their medication. Keeping a routine, I spoke about this last week, um, even talking about our children, that it's really important that we keep a routine. Um, sleeping in till all, you know, whatever time, being up until all hours of the night. Um, it's kind of, my mom is kind of funny. Um, my parents just, as I mentioned, retired in January. My mom is 81, my dad is 86. And um, they are, they have always gotten up super early. They've gone and worked out before work and then they worked a full day and came home and had dinner. Um, now they are sleeping later and they're having a late breakfast, early lunch and then they're going for their exercise and then they're having a late dinner and then they're staying up a little bit later than they used to. Um, even though it's, it's not ideal in terms of sleep, um, although they're still getting enough sleep, um, that schedule is working for them because it's still a schedule. They're still doing the same thing every single day, even though all the hours have shifted um, to a little bit later because they don't have to go to work. So whatever the routine is, making sure that it is consistent. Essential oils. Um, these are, you know, essential oils are a wonderful way of managing stress. Different scents can make people feel calm, like lavender. So if people are independent and they want to have a diffuser in their home, but also that this is essential oils can be tricky because they can interfere with medication. So it is important to know, number one, if they have any allergies uh, on any of these essential oils, um, but also if like things like grapefruit can interfere with certain medications. So um, essential oils need to be treated carefully and there needs to be some research done before introducing them, but they can also be a really helpful stress manager, uh, stress management tool. Getting outside, and it's not just about vitamin D, although that's obviously one of the important parts of getting outside. Sunshine also helps us to reset our circadian rhythm and help us to sleep at night. So getting some full sun in the morning is going to help us to sleep at night. It triggers the, our body to know that it's daytime versus nighttime. And, um, but the other piece of that is being in touch with nature. And I talked about this last week with our kids. It's the same with adults. We need to be outside. We need to be around plants. And if you've got someone in your life who can't go outside, having live plants in their rooms can also be very beneficial. It actually helps to clean the air. It adds good oxygen to the air. And the greenery is restful. There was a study done in Denmark. This was fascinating. They studied the entire country. So there were over 900,000 people who participated in this research study. And they looked at people from the time that they were born until they were 10 years old. And they studied um, how much anxiety, depression, and bipolar, and they looked at schizophrenia and anorexia between for the people who lived in Denmark during a certain period of time up, up until the age of 10. And they looked to see how, mon, how many of these people had neurological disorders after 10 years old. And what they found was that the people who had access to the most greenery, even if it was looking out of a window and looking at plants, had a lower neurological disorder uh, rate than the people who did not have access to greenery. So we are, we were born to live outside. We, um, our bodies are, crave being outside. The Japanese call it forest bathing to immerse ourselves in the outdoors. So any way that we can get our older folks outside, maybe um, in a garden, somewhere obviously where they're not gonna trip and fall and hurt themselves. Um, so going on a nature, a nature path might be a little more challenging unless you can find um, a path that was built for just that, that's you know cleared and easy to navigate. But getting them outside and getting them 
um, in the sunshine, seeing plants, uh, super, super important for our mental health. And then of course, staying in touch with loved ones. They can also support themselves with gratitude. And of course, this depends on the person. Uh, some people will enjoy keeping a gratitude journal. Some people will enjoy typing a gratitude journal. Some people enjoy just prayer. Um, obviously, the churches and synagogues and you know, congregating together in prayer has been, um, un, un, we've been unable to do that, but hopefully that's starting to come back. And certainly, many organizations have um, created uh, streaming and ways of people staying in con connected that way. Um, so what you have to talk to your older friend or loved one and ask them what, um, what they think might be helpful and how they can express gratitude. Deep breathing, we talked about deep breathing um, in the first and second session. Again, that's the um, belly breathing, the diaphragm breathing, and this is something that can very easily be taught to anybody, teaching them how to not just breathe from the, their lungs, but taking a deep breath all the way down into their diaphragm, allowing their belly to expand, and then letting that air out slowly um, so that they can um, activate that vagus nerve that, that actually activates the parasympathetic nervous system and helps the body to settle back down. Emotional freedom technique or tapping, another tool that can be used. I have taught my mother how to use tapping. Um, there is no reason that somebody who's older can't learn how to use tapping. Even if they can't remember all of the tapping points, they can utilize one or two tapping points. That's really all it takes to have an, an effect. So again, if anyone wants more information about tapping or you need more handouts on tapping, I'm happy to do a session or to teach you how to do it. Again, fresh food. Very important that um, people are eating uh, a healthy protein, a healthy carbohydrate like fruits and vegetables and healthy fats at every meal and every snack and helping them to avoid fast foods, alcohol, sugar, and fried foods. So if you think it would be fun to drop off um, you know, a cake for Nana or some fried, her favorite fried chicken, you might not be doing her the best, um, the best good and maybe you could find some healthier versions of those foods. There are ways of, um, of frying food by baking it or not using um, certain oils. Um, so you can make foods that are tasty and close to what they're used to, but avoiding some of the foods that might actually be, de be detrimental to their health. And then, as I mentioned, the supplements. And by the way, with supplements, um, I want to um, be clear with people that um, I like for people to avoid the big box stores when they buy supplements. Uh, I know sometimes that's where the best prices are, but those products are often not the best quality. Finding a local health food store, like in Atlanta, for those of you that are here, Good Nutrition is a really good store. Um, some um, Sprouts, which is a grocery store chain, they often, and Whole Foods, they often have good brands. Um, if you have any questions about brands, feel free to contact me. If you want me to help you to order um, some supplements, I have accounts with various companies and I can have uh, quality supplements drop shipped to people if you're interested um, in doing that. And um, what we talked about gratitude and journaling. Um, journaling can be anything from just doing kind of what's called a brain dump, where you open up a book and you just write what you're grateful for for the day, or you can just write down one to three things that you're grateful for in each day, and every day it needs to be something different. And writing is better than typing. We actually learn better when we connect our brain with our hand to the paper than when we are typing. So if you can get somebody to write, that's ideal. If they can't write for whatever reason or they prefer to type, I have actually journaled using, I've done a gratitude journal typing and found that it worked just fine for me. So it can, it can work if, um, if, if that's the only tool that they have. Um, this is a, a gratitude prayer that I introduced last week that I absolutely loved. This was done in a um, college study looking at gratitude. The uh, researchers had the students say this saying four times, these four sentences twice a day, and they were able to measure an increase in people's uh, feeling of, of gratitude and a lowering of anxiety after just a period of a couple of weeks. So you can share this gratitude saying with anybody that you want to, um, where they can say, may you feel safe, may you feel happy, may you feel health, and may you live in peace. And then you say it 
four different ways. You say it with yourself in mind, you say it thinking about family and friends, you say it thinking about your, the greater community and people who are working to keep you safe, and then you say it a fourth time thinking about everybody in the world. How can we support our elderly? So what can we do when we're not able to go visit? One of the things that you can do is um, this company, I came across this this week, they actually have a product, it's about, it's under $200, it was like $170, where you can actually um, test your stress level by testing your cortisol level. Now, if somebody's gonna test cortisol levels, it needs to be a test, and I didn't look this one up, I should have. Um, that test cortisol four times because we are cortisol is on a on a circadian rhythm of of um, high in the morning and low at night. So when we're testing cortisol, we really do want to check in and see how our bodies are managing throughout the course of a day. But if you're really concerned about somebody's stress level, they can take a cortisol stress test. You can make sure that they get counseling. Some facilities will provide that. There are lots of therapists out there, I'm one of them, that would be happy to work with people. Um, there are lots of agencies that provide counseling for elderly, including churches that have um, Christian counseling services. In Atlanta, there's a service called Jewish Family and Children's Services that offer services to everyone. You don't have to be Jewish to use them. They offer sliding scales. Um, and then making sure that they have safe access to the food, medical care, and contact with others that they need. Using technology, and of course, this is a problem for some of our younger old people. Technology is something that they can use. My parents, because they've been working up until recently, are great on computers. They actually can text and email, and they can do um, Zoom meetings. So we're able to um, stay in touch with them pretty closely, even though we haven't been able to visit. Some people can't navigate all of that quite as easily, so just more frequent phone calls might be in order. Sending meals, so this is a way that you can help to control their diets a little bit and make sure that they're getting some of those healthy foods. There's a great organization in Atlanta, a company called Instead of Flowers, that will deliver meals to people. Um, and of course, it depends on if they can cook, if they have access to a kitchen, or if they are more dependent on um, people cooking for them. Then you might wanna just bring some fruit, maybe have delivered some fruit or some fresh vegetables that they could eat. Send letters. Um, the, the generation that is older has grown up on letters, not on technology, and they love getting mail. I am currently writing to four elderly people, friends and family of people that I know, and one of the women, one of the, my friends emailed me this week and she said, my mother got another one of her fun letters from you. So she designates my mail as her fun mail and she loves getting it. So I write, um, I just write a note. I just dash off something about what I'm doing this week. I talk about the weather. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be detailed, but just so that they know somebody cares about them, sending them a letter is a wonderful way to stay in touch. Hallmark Design Studio has a software package that you can make your own cards. It costs $29.99, and I went online and I looked at it. It looks like a lot of fun, lots of options. So if you have a, a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle and you've got kids in your home, if you buy the software, then maybe you guys could all sit down and do a craft project together and send grandma um, or, or um, grandpa um, a homemade card. Um, of course, just construction paper and um, some crayons can also do the trick. Sending pictures, lots and lots of pictures, making sure that there's plants, as I mentioned earlier, in their rooms or in their homes, and drive-by visits. Um, even if you can't go inside, just standing in the driveway and visiting um, really does a lot, uh, you know, and helps people. My parents came by um, earlier this week to pick up some groceries, and I had, I had a time commitment, so I was up against a a deadline and my mom just she just didn't want to leave she said i just hate to even leave um, because it's so nice to see you so just and all we were doing was standing in the driveway so um, it is important for us to see each other and be near each other and then support for the caregivers if you are somebody who is taking care of an older person just like we talked about with the kids put your oxygen mask on first Make sure that you are taking care of yourself, that you have good sleep, exercise, nutrition, time outdoors, so that you have the energy to be there for them because you really do have to step up your game 
and spend a little more time with them. Take breaks throughout the day, particularly if you've got somebody that you're caring for in your own home. Call and talk to other people outside of your home, get the support that you need. Watch something light, watch something that makes you laugh. Stay away from a lot of the news, stay away from some of the heavy duty stuff that you can see on Netflix and Primetime and all those other channels that we have access to so many things. Um, try to stay away from the, the really heavy, heavy uh, violent things. Find a way to laugh and engage in something that you enjoy, like hobbies and like cooking and puzzles and needle, needlework, craft work, going for walks, um, whatever it is that fills you up so that you have the, the time and the energy to give back to the loved one, your loved one. And I wanted to share this as a final slide. This was sent out by one of my rowing friends last week in her newsletter. Um, I love this, um, this cartoon where Pooh says, what day is it? And Piglet says, it's today. And Pooh says, my favorite day. So I wanna, I'm gonna stop the share now and open us back up to um, the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have.